Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, all good. How are you? I'm all right, thanks. How are you? Yeah, very well. Firstly, thank you so, so much for agreeing to join me on uh, oh, no. episode of uh, Carper and Natta Series 3, right in the next chapter. And it is honestly an absolute honour to have such full team royalty join me. So thank you very much for joining me. <laughs> no, not at all. Thank you for having me. So as Britain's greatest ever female gymnast, um, a triple Olympian, um, a London 2012 bronze medalist, obviously on home soil, three-time world champion, seven-time European champion, Commonwealth champion, the list can go on. And honestly, I think the success that you've had since retiring is even more impressive as well. So honestly, couldn't have asked for a better guest to uh, join me. So thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you. Okay, so to kick things off, I'm going to ask what everyone likes to know about my cup and natter guests, and that's how they like their tea. Okay. So I'm, oh, I don't drink it. <laughs> you don't? Okay, so I'm so I'll, 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 I'll still ask you five quick fire questions, if that's all right. And then we'll just, okay, yeah. we'll have to run with it. Okay, so you've kind of uh, answered my first question in terms of breakfast tea or herbal tea. Neither. Neither. Okay, so what is your drink of choice then? Um, do you know what, just juice or I do like a Diet Coke as well. <laughs> okay so in the morning what's your go-to drink so for me it's a cup of tea what what would yours be um yeah just water or juice nothing there uh, and yeah I'm really bad I remember when I was training I always got told that I didn't drink enough and so yeah it's uh, I'm really bad when it comes to staying hydrated and drinking whatever drink you're meant to drink all day <laughs> it's not a bad thing you I'll take it Coffee's a no-no? Yeah, I don't really drink hot drinks, to be honest. Just, I've never, never liked the taste of it. And coffee, my classroom at school always was outside that staff room. And the smell of coffee first thing in the morning, well, oh, yeah, not my, not my cup of tea. Bad, bad memory. Well, I mean, Beth, you're making Cupper and Natta um, history by being <laughs> the first guest to never drink tea. So thank you very much and cheers to you. Well, I'll take it. I'll take it. <laughs> okay, so I kind of pre-warned you that I ask all of my cup and natter guests three questions. Okay. Um, so the first question I think is going to be quite hard because as I've touched upon, you've had a pretty phenomenal gymnastics career. Um, in my opinion, when I think of gymnastics, when I think of the uneven bars, I instantly think of Beth Tweddle, of course. And you oh. reinvented the sport, you inspired the next generation, you know, the likes of Becky and Ellie Downey and looking back on your career now can you pinpoint like one highlight or one achievement throughout your career that really sticks out for you? Gosh um do you know what there is a couple um when I was 17 it was kind of my breakthrough year 2002 um and we had the Commonwealth Games in Manchester and obviously at the time, we had no idea that the Olympic Games was going to be in London in 2012. So for me, I thought that was going to be my opportunity to compete in front of a home crowd. Um, 17 years old, had all of my school friends there watching. My whole family was there, um, including my nan. Um, and she pretty much only ever got to watch on TV. But uh, because it was in Manchester, they, they brought her up. So she got to come and see me live. Um, so that is definitely a memory that I'll treasure and obviously winning gold on home soil, literally in my back garden, um, was a dream come true. Um, and then obviously London. Um, having gone to Beijing the year before and come forth and having come home from that competition and kind of reflected, do I continue with gymnastics? Do I retire? What's the what's the plan and I think a lot of athletes go through that after a major tournament of uh, do you continue but I think having come home from Beijing and being so disappointed being 0.025 away from that Olympic dream um, knowing that London was just around the corner it, it was a pull too much I just could not walk away from it and as an individual I wanted to be able to say 
I, I tried. I, I never wanted to look back on my career. I would have hated to have sat in the audience in London and thought, I wish I'd tried for this. Don't get me wrong. It's, as you know, it's a lot of hours training. There's lots of ups and downs, whether it's injuries, whether it's disappointments at competitions, but 100% it is, it's worth it in the long run. Um, so definitely to stand on that medal podium in London, again in front of that home crowd and just when I walked into that arena the amount of flags and banners that children have made and um, knowing that your parents are in the audience and kind of there was so many of like my mom and dad's village they'd all managed to get tickets and had gone down to London my brother was in the crowd so yeah it was just the icing on top of the cake to compete in London but also to to pick up that dream there it's 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 really interesting actually and obviously you touched upon obviously the disappointment that you had just one year previous to to London 2012 and actually the resilience that you've obviously shown over that year to carry on when it was so close that you could have just stopped a lot of athletes probably could have taken that easy opportunity okay I'm so disappointed by that being so close to a medal do you think that the tie of having it as a home Olympic Games made it extra special in terms of this is me resetting, going again for one final year. And then obviously we all know what happened. Definitely. I mean, I think if you speak to any of the athletes that retired after London, um, would they have told you that they probably would have retired after Beijing? I think a lot of them would have given you the answer yes, but with it being in London, they. You, you just can't walk away from it. I mean, the Olympics in itself is a dream come true, but to be able to have that Olympics on home soil. Um, we also had the World Championships in London in the O2 Arena in 2009. So that kind of gave me a flavour of what it would feel like to compete in London in front of that home crowd. And um, yeah, I, I, I couldn't walk away with that. I was never openly... Uh, very open about wanting to go to that London Olympics because I knew that obviously I was pushing the age boundary with gymnastics I was I mean I was 24 in um, at 27 when I did the games in London and um, obviously for gymnastics for female gymnasts at the time that was seen as quite old um, so I never openly admitted all I did was in my own training and working with Amanda was kind of break it down into six month slots we as a sport have a major championships every year we have Europeans and worlds every year apart from on the Olympic year and um, so I had six months targets to work towards and that's what allowed me to kind of work those four years from Beijing into London. I mean it highlights that obviously I, I remember I remember it so vividly actually your performance that, that in that final in uh, London 2012 and obviously I had the pleasure of re-watching all of the highlights back in preparation <laughs> today um, but just it gave me goosebumps and I can't even imagine what it felt like for yourself and everything that you'd been through everything that you'd achieved in your career kind of coming down to that final in London 2012 an absolute highlight and uh, I'm kind of pleased that you touched upon that to be fair um, but yeah. I guess my, it moves me on quite nicely in terms of my second question because this series of Kappa and Nata is based on former athletes that have had just as much success uh, as they had in their respective sports post-retiring and I mean I can touch upon it a little bit later but I'm really interested to hear what you think in terms of what do you think has been the proudest achievement that you've had post-retiring in 2013 and you've achieved a lot so this is a hard question as well. Yeah. Um, do you know, I, I started making preparations for my retirement way before I retired. So, um, obviously as a young gymnast, I did it because I enjoyed it. Um, I picked up a major injury when I was 12 years old and um, to the fact that the doctors weren't hundred percent sure I'd get back to competing. I, I broke my ankle quite badly. Um, and at, at that time, gymnastics, wasn't successful um, for British gymnasts on an international scene. It wasn't something that was seen that you could um, 
obviously make a career out of. Um, so my parents were very keen to keep my education um, going alongside my sport. And I've always been a huge advocate for making sure that you've kind of got that two sides to your life. Um, and my current business partner, Steve Parry, he was um, an Olympic bronze medal swimmer. Um, he won bronze in Athens in 2004. And I owe a huge amount to him actually for what I've achieved since I retired because he approached me having set up his own business in swimming and kind of said, um, I, I really want to do something with you along um, the lines of gymnastics and what he does with swimming. And that's obviously providing um, swimming to, to young children. Um, and obviously gymnastics is a very popular sport for young children. So um, because of Steve, he kind of said to me, look, don't wait until you retire. Um, because obviously then it takes time to get it set up you um, you've already kind of you may find it a lot harder whereas he said to me look I, I'm happy to support you let's get this company up and running together and obviously whilst you're competing that can be your main focus but this can kind of go along in the background you can get as involved or as not involved um, and then obviously when you retire it's there if you want to kind of come into the business element um, so because of that um, Best Seller Gymnastics was set up in 2010 um, and I never dreamt of it becoming as big as it did um, we started off with kind of 20 children um, in Liverpool um, and um, we've now got something like 3,000 children on the programme doing gymnastics week in, week out. And then we also do it in curriculum time in school. And that is definitely my biggest kind of proudest moment because yes, gymnastics taught me how to win Olympic medals and world medals and stuff, but actually the sense of achievement of seeing a young child do their full draw for the first time or, we were lucky enough after COVID, well not after COVID because we haven't passed it yet, but um, after the first lockdown, um, I was uh, prepping my own purpose-built gym um, and it was due to open in April. It actually opened on the 25th of July and seeing the children's faces when they came into that gym, having been in lockdown for so long, was just everything to me they were smiling from ear to ear some of them were seeing their school friends for the first time since March and the joy on their face of seeing their school friends for the first time it just made everything that I do worthwhile for those children and obviously I think physical activity for children at the minute is just so important because everything else is just so strange for them they're they're not allowed to go to friends houses after school they're not allowed to everything has just been turned upside down for them so having that kind of one thing in their life that is consistent um and I'm, I'm sure you're the same for me gymnastics was my life I, I I would have been in there 24 hours a day had I not had to go to school but obviously you still had to go to school um so I think to, and that was the really long answer but to answer you very quickly is just seeing the smiles on the kids faces and um especially in curriculum for some of those children they may never get the opportunity to do gymnastics outside of school yeah, and, and I mean, firstly, congratulations, because I think it, what you've done for your sport in your sporting career was phenomenal. But I think what you've achieved since retiring in setting up Beth Tweddle Gymnastics, and as you said, touched upon, you know, opening up your own gymnastics centre. <laughs> I think that's just as powerful. And honestly, like a huge congratulations to yourself for doing that. Do you think that actually, was it based around you and the, the kind of experience that you had growing up, obviously you must have thrived in the sport growing up and loved it from, from an early age. Do you think that that kind of made you want to give everyone else the same opportunity that you had? Yeah, and I think also, I, I alluded to it before, it, we're not there to create the next world or Olympic champion. We are there as grassroots level sport. And obviously if a child... Um, shows a talent or they show an interest in wanting to, to take it to a competitive level then we will help point them in the right direction but for me sport gives you so much other stuff 
um, that you can take into life, whether it's teamwork, whether it's leadership, perseverance, resilience, determination. Um, I think all of those skills you pick up by being in the gym or being on a sports field. So um, I think that there's more reasons than just being physically active and learning the skill of the sport that they're learning. There's, there's so many reasons for children to be doing sport. Yeah, and I guess for, for the young gymnasts, you know, joining your joining your centre and joining in with your classes, there's probably no better teacher to learn from <laughs> than yourself. I mean, I'm a bit tempted, yeah. Beth, I must admit. I, it, I've said it previously, if I could be good at any other sport, I would choose gymnastics. I struggle with a forward role, so I feel like I need to come to some <laughs> of your classes, honestly. You know what? I tried um, hockey and yeah, it's, it's not for me. <laughs> Getting hit with the stick, it was, I, I don't, it was cold and because my family were very hockey orientated. Wow. So I actually grew up with a hockey stick in my hand. I was at the hockey club every weekend. Um, my brother competed um, up until England under 21 level. So it, it's a big sport in our house, but yeah. I was on the side of the hockey pitch doing the cartwheels and the flips rather than on it doing what I was meant to be doing. I must admit, I, I, from a selfish point of view, I'm gutted that you didn't carry through with the hockey. <laughs> but I mean, from a gymnastics point of view, as I touched upon, you have well and truly changed the, the future of gymnastics, in my opinion, single-handedly. So good decision, I must admit. Um, <laughs> so for my third question, um, so I've kind of touched upon that You've stayed very heavily involved in, in your gymnastics since retiring and you've touched upon obviously the Beth Tweddles gymnastics and the new centre that's been opened previously. Um, but what next? Because, I mean, we haven't even touched upon all of the fantastic work with charities that you do. You're even a Dancing on Ice champion. <laughs> what next? What's the next um, ambition and plan for yourself in the next, you know, five, ten years? Yeah, I mean... From a young age, I've always liked to keep myself busy. Um, and obviously, I was very passionate when I retired that I would keep myself busy. Mm -hmm. So obviously, Beth Tuttle Gymnastics was there, but um, you, you alluded to the charity stuff. I, I just love working with children. So that was one of the reasons that I got involved with um, Older Hay Children's Hospital, Clare House, um, because I just, I think this so much influence that you can have on children and they're just amazing the stories that they tell you the fun that you can have with them um, and then the other side of it is obviously um switch to play um, foundation which i work um as a trustee on um i've been through that transition of being an elite athlete everyone says to you what what do you do i'm an elite athlete and then suddenly the day you retire even now people say to me what's your job and I kind of go um I'm a former athlete like you, you don't know kind of how to identify with yourself um so obviously having gone through that transition of since seven years old up until 28 years old my title was I'm an elite athlete um and then stepping away from that and having to find my way through to becoming kind of a business person and obviously I had a lot of support behind me I was lucky that my parents had kept my education up when I was younger I had Steve kind of as a business mentor and um, Chris Brindley worked within uh, Beth Little Gymnastics as well so he kind of um, helped and mentored me and there's loads of people that have helped that um, but I think athletes once they step away from their sport they don't know what to do. Sometimes uh, they're just kind of taking time to figure out what their passion is, figure out um, what do they do next. Um, and I think with Switch to Play, we are working really, really hard on um, changing that focus from making those decisions when you retire to actually can you start thinking about those decisions before you retire are there courses that you could do is there things that you could be doing in the background and um, so obviously when i was competing as a gymnast we we had access to um i think they've changed the title of it now but it was kind of a lifestyle uh, funding so uh, i did numerous courses uh, i did bookkeeping totally found out that I am not going to be an accountant even though I've married one um, he, he deals with all that side of it um, but by doing that course I realized that just wasn't for me 
Um, I did a massage course and as much as I enjoy doing it, I realised that that wasn't something that I could do day in, day out. Um, and I think it's just really important for athletes to, to start thinking about that prior to retiring. And actually, I think some people have got it that they feel they can't do both. Um, but there's so many examples out there of athletes that have, I don't know, past medical degrees, past veterinary degrees, um, done university, done apprenticeships alongside their career. And they've actually found that it's helped their career. And um, so for me, if I was having a bad day in the gym, I was able to switch off, go to university or go and do my work experience and just kind of have a gym bath and a normal bath. Um, so as soon as I shut the doors on the gym, obviously you're kind of maintaining your, um, your nutrition and obviously looking after your body. But I was able to switch off from gymnastics. Um, I had one year where I solely focused on gymnastics and I found that really, really difficult. I, if I had a bad day in the gym, I went home, I stressed about it. I then didn't sleep because I was stressing about having a bad day in the gym. I then got up the next day to go training and you're still worrying about the day before. Whereas actually, um, when I started doing university, I was able to shut the door on the gym. I went home to my university friends and they just kind of went, how was training? I was like rubbish. And then they just changed the topic because to them it wasn't the be all and end all. And that really helped me um, with my gymnastics career. And I, I was lucky, British Gymnastics and my personal coach Amanda, they both um, were really supportive of me kind of having those two different elements um, in, my, in my life. Um, and also I got to go to things like World University Games, um, which was, again, international exposure prior to World Championships. So I, I think it's just um, making sure that athletes are exposing themselves to lots of different things. But I mean, you ask what next? And the answer is I kind of go with the flow a little bit, but my ultimate passion is creating the opportunity for every child to have a go at gymnastics they may love it they may hate it but do you know what unless they are exposed to it they'll never know i was lucky that my parents exposed me to hockey swimming ballet and i soon realized that ballet hockey and that they just weren't for me um but gymnastics was the one that i loved and happened to be quite good at so um yeah, that's my ultimate goal is just to provide the opportunity for every child to do gymnastics. I mean, just just listening to your answer just then, it just is so obvious that you're so passionate about helping others. And actually, <laughs> I, I could have just listened to your answer about the transition, because for me, obviously, um, I have that identity at the moment as a Great Britain and England hockey player. But it is yeah. the reality that sport doesn't last forever. And actually having that experience that you do and having been there and done that for switch the play, for example, I bet they're rubbing their hands together to have you involved. <laughs> um, and then, I guess, as you touched upon, you know, the fantastic work you're doing, inspiring the future generations of Beth Tweddles and, you know, throughout every single level of gymnastics and getting more people involved is just phenomenal. So good luck with everything. I'm sure it's going to be just as oh. successful as it has been. Um, I'm very wary of the time, so I hope you don't mind, but... Over the last couple of series of Cuppa and Natter, they've been on Instagram Live and I've been able to ask questions from social media. I am going to tell you now, I am the worst person with social media. Um, I have not got a clue. I constantly bring my friends. Someone asked me to do a swipe up the other day <laughs> and I literally, I had to get um, someone to ask Becky Addington. I was like, Becky, how the heck do I do this? So, as long as you're not asking me to do something on social media, if only I'd known that before, I could have like stitched you up big time. But yeah. <laughs> I've, got a few, I've got a few quick fire fun fact questions for you. Okay, you might okay. or might not know the answer, but let's just roll with it. Okay, okay. are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, in 2006, you obviously won your first world championship medal, being a gold in terms of on the uneven bars set history for GB uh, gymnastics but can you remember what was the winning score 16.2 oh, 
something along those lines. Too good, too good. Very good. Okay, for yeah. one, one, it's spot on. 16.2. Okay. Question number two, you've obviously touched upon the fantastic memories you have of London 2012. But how many gymnasts were in Team GB representing at London 2012? How many gymnasts? How many gymnasts in total? Is that including, is that all disciplines? All disciplines. Oh gosh. Um, so we had, rhythmic, was it five? This is memory if you get this. Is it 17? Oh, 18, so close. Oh, oh, oh. Do you yeah. know what the, uh, I couldn't remember, is the, the rhythmic must have had six in their team, not five. So it was five artistic women, five artistic men, two, two trampoline, or was it three trampoline? That's maybe where I've got it wrong. Very, I mean, a valley definitely to be fair. Okay, last one. I think you'll get this. Obviously, in uh, 20, 2006, after your world championship success, you came third at Sports Personality of the Year. Okay, the first gymnast to be included in the, in the shortlist, which is incredible in itself, you came third. Who came first and second? So Zara Phillips came first, um, and it was Darren, um, is it Darren Clark, the golfer? Smashed it. Absolutely. Uh, do you know what? Can you write the questions for question and sport? Because I'm always rubbish on them, but the fact that you've asked me them, and I feel like I, I can actually answer some stuff. My husband laughed at me because he says my general knowledge is awful. Well, I, I might have to, I might have to, I mean, I don't know who obviously is the new host. I could forward them on to Sue Barker and then get you on straight away. So you'll be the star it's of the positive. show. It's a pleasure. <laughs> well, no, honestly, I, I, I'm wary that 30 minutes is pretty much up. My mug of tea is empty and I'm sure yours is too, if you are, if you're just- oh, totally, Yeah, I didn't even bother making one. <laughs> I mean, I now know that Beth Tweddle is not a fan of warm drinks, so I might have to change the name of this. Um, <laughs> but no, thank you so, so much for being really generous with your time. I really appreciate you joining no, us. all. Thank you. And for everyone else, thank you very much for joining us. My next guest will be revealed on Sunday at 6pm, so keep your eyes peeled for that. Uh, but in the meantime, keep that kettle boiled, keep nattering using hashtag cup and natter, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, on Monday. Take care. Thanks, Beth. See you later. Thank you so much.